So I need to ask you a super important question, and I want you to take your time and really think about your answer here, and because this could define our entire relationship moving forward. What would you call a carbonated sugary beverage that usually comes in a can? Um, it's very sweet. What would you call it? Just a generic, not a brand name for it, but just generically, what would you say if you, if I said, can you get me a one of these, and I'm referring to this kind of beverage, what would you say? Hopefully you got the answer correct. The correct answer is pop. If you said soda, you may be a communist. That's okay, but the correct answer is pop. Uh, the correct answer is not soda. The correct answer is not Coke, just generically, as they say in some parts of the country either, but pop as a good firm Midwesterner, I can tell you that. Uh, another question, what do you say when somebody sneezes? What do you say? What's the appropriate thing to say when somebody sneezes? Or how about this? What if somebody invited you to, to this event where they said, hey, I'm going to this event. There's going to be a bunch of tractors. They're going to pull some weight down a track and see who can make it the furthest or maybe the fastest or whatever. Does that sound like fun to you? Because I can tell you, at some parts of the country, like the one where I grew up in, this is a major part of our of our culture, and that's really what we're getting at. The answer to all of those things would really depend on your culture, whether you say pop or soda or coke, whether you say God bless you or Gesundheit or or salut or whatever you say, whether you would be interested in a tractor pull event or not, uh, really depends on your culture, where you grew up, what's the norm for you. And, and, and so, you know, that's all very unique and, and different. And so what does that really mean? What is culture? So that's what we want to do today. All, I mean, culture is, is so kind of vague in some ways and for some people. And, uh, but so what we really want to do today is just really hone in on defining culture. What exactly is culture? What is not culture? And let's make sure we're all on the same page moving forward as we continue to talk about culture and intercultural communication here. So very simply, uh, the definition of culture that we're going to be using here is the learned and shared set of symbols, language, values, and norms used to distinguish one group of people from another. Okay, simple enough, right? Let's break this down a little bit more, though. Okay, we're going to let's take this apart piece by piece and see what we mean. So first of all, culture, again, the learned and shared set of symbols, language, values, and norms used to distinguish one group of people from another. So we start off with the idea that culture is learned and shared. Culture is not something that we're born with. Uh, you don't just, you know, you're not just born with these, these set ideas of who you are and what's the norm and what, what's good and what's bad and what value should we have. And we learn it from the people around us. It's a generational thing, right? We learn it from spending time with our family and our loved ones and our friends. And, and it's something that we share, you know, that we learn and we share what's the appropriate way to dance. Yeah, right. What's the appropriate way to say that carbonated sugary beverage? You know, what's the one you hear all the time when you're growing up? Did you hear pop? Did you hear soda? What did you learn from those around you? And in turn, then that's what we're likely to share with those around us as well. Okay. So culture is learned and shared. It is not something that we're born with. It is not at this uncontrollable um, thing that, uh, that we, that we have, you know, again, no control over. Um, but, but it is something that is learned and shared and we have a great deal of influence over, over it in that respect. So, okay. But culture is something that is 100% learned and shared, not something that, that is born into us or that we are born with. Uh, no, so then the components of culture as we talked about in that definition, there are four components of culture. Um, and so let's take a look at each of those here just real quickly. First we have symbols. Okay. So symbols are not just, you know, the, the, we know that all communication really, in essence, is representative of something else, right? Communication, words, language, things like that. It's not magical. It just is something that represents something else. Okay. So um, uh, that's a, a component of culture as well, that we have these symbols that are important to us in whatever culture we're a part of. So let's just take uh, the American culture. For example, if you, if you are from the United States, if you are an American, Part of our culture is learned that is learned and shared it has to do with these symbols that we have and we that are very important to us, such as the flag, for example, right? The American flag, really important symbol 
you know, in essence, really just a piece of fabric or, or a group of pieces of fabric, depending on how it's made, right? Of different colors and a specific design, but it represents, it's, it's symbolic. It's, it symbolizes America. It symbolizes the things that, that we hope our nation stands for independence, freedom, equality, all these things that we're at least striving for. Even if we haven't achieved it yet, that we're striving for. It's representative of all that. So this little piece of fabric really has to carry a lot of weight, which is why it's so important to us. Uh, another symbol of the United States is baseball. Now, baseball is not even necessarily the most popular sport in the United States. I mean, I think it's at best third right now behind football and uh, and basketball. But but baseball is a truly American sport. It's one that we create. It's, it's wholly ours, and it is the American pastime, right? So it is symbolic of the United States, not only the sport itself, but the idea of going out to a game and, and enjoying it, you know, getting some Cracker Jack and enjoying it with your family or playing as you grew up a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people played uh, baseball or softball growing up. So, I mean, it was just very symbolic, very American, right? And of course, another one that we have is that, you know, that's, that's American is apple pie, right? American is apple pie. And here you have all three of them, the flag, baseball, and apple pie, uh, because they are all so symbolic in the United States. I mean, the pie, you know, whether we realize it or not, pie is kind of an American thing. This uh, kind of sweet pie, especially fruits, uh, fruit in a pie is kind of an American thing. And especially these apple pie is just a, about as American as you can get, right? So these things are symbolic. They represent parts of our culture. And, the, and so uh, that is one of the things that, that brings us together, though, too, right? This, these are things that are symbols that are important to our culture, that we learn are important. And so they are, they are an aspect of American culture. Let's think about language. If, we were, if we're thinking about language, again, as far as American culture, um, we're thinking English, right? That's kind of the, uh, you know, the United States does not have an official language, but English is the language that's most commonly spoken. Or lots of languages are spoken here, but English is kind of the, the language. It's the language that we typically share here in the United States. But every culture is going to have its own um, different kind of language, right? Big cultures and small cultures. And uh, just think about your workplace, for example. Your workplace has a language that goes along with it that's probably unique to that that workplace, that office, that location, right? Um, certainly that industry may be unique to that, but also in, in just in that office, we all have a little shorthand that we develop with language. Uh, or think about a hobby that you have that has different verbiage that goes along with it, right? Um, language that goes along with any hobby that you have that may be unique to that. It may mean something different within that hobby. So uh, language has uh, Im importance in a culture as well. So a culture is defined in part by having this common language. Yeah. Another component of culture is l values. Okay. So again, if we were to come back to the United States and what's our culture here in the United States, uh, I mentioned a, a little bit ago, you know, we value a variety of things and we aspire to these things. At least we value them, whether we've achieved them or not is another thing, but we, uh, you know, fully achieve them is another thing, but we value things like liberty, freedom, independence. These are all things that we, that we value here in the United States as Americans. We value um, uh, justice, right? We, we value um, this, this sense of justice that we have here. We value, um, equality, really all men are created equal, right? It's right there in the, in the uh, declaration of independence. So these are things that we value. And again, we can, we can discuss whether or not we've actually achieved these things and, uh, and we, we still have some work to do, but these are things that we value. They, they are things that we aspire to and things that we claim as part of our culture and being important to our culture. And then finally, what are some norms of culture? This, this, the other thing norms are just kind of What's the what's the usual? What's the regular in that culture? What's considered regular or or normal in that culture? So some of the norms here for the United States are, for example, that we eat meat, and specifically we eat, typically eat meat like beef and pork and and chicken and those types of meats, as opposed to, you know, horse and dog and which which are common in other cultures. It depends on what you have available. We could get into the whole discussion about, you know, what resources resources are available, but. But we are not everybody, of course, but we are we typically are meat eaters here in the United States and we typically eat a certain kind of meat and we enjoy gathering over, uh, you know, a good cookout uh, as part of our culture as well. Another norm here is that we drive on the right side of the road, not only the, you know, directionally the right side of the road, but also the correct side of the road. Of course, those of you driving on the left hand side of the road, I'm sorry, um, but you are not in the right. You are literally in the left. So you are not on the right. Uh, but we drive on the right hand side of the road here in the United States. Uh, another norm here in the United States is that we live in houses a lot of times, right? Now, people live in big cities, they live in apartments and things, 
but kind of the traditional idea of America is this homestead where we have at least our own house and a yard and things. And there are other parts of the country, other parts of the world, but that is just not even really thought about. This is not the norm. Um, so but because in the United States, we've had historically had so much space that everybody's had kind of the opportunity to spread out a little bit and have their own kind of big house with a fenced in yard and the 2.5 kids or whatever. So these are all things that are normal to us and norms for the United States that may be different in different cultures. But every culture is going to have these uh, four components to it. Symbols, language, values, norms, any culture that you belong to. If you belong to you know, a knitting club, then it's going to have different symbols that are important to it. Symbols, maybe the types of a yarn that you're using or the types of needles that you're using. I don't even know if this, that's the right terminology, speaking of language, by the way. But there are things, you know, that, you may, that, that you know, knitters are going to know that non-knitters may not realize are symbolic of that culture and important within that culture. Um, you know, maybe a certain kind of basket that you keep things. In. I don't know. I'm not a knitter. That's a poor example. I shouldn't have chosen that one. Uh, but so maybe there's a, there's something with that knitting culture and also language. As I said, there's probably knitting. I know that my, so my wife has been watching these crochet videos lately. And I know from just having them on in the background that there are, you know, certain terminology of the types of, I don't even know what it's, what you're doing in crochet, but certain types of maneuvers, I guess, that you're doing with the, the crochet hooks. And uh, so there's a language that goes along with it. I don't understand that language, but I can tell you for sure that there is one because they're saying it all the time, and I just don't understand it, right? So, and what are the values? People who are, you know, do crochet or do knitting and things like that, do handcrafted type things, probably value something that is made by hand. Value the personalization of something that is really made by someone for someone else or for their own use or whatever. They get that satisfaction. So that's something they probably value. Uh, so there are different values that go along with that. Again, I'm just speculating uh, about knitters. I apologize uh, if I got that wrong for, for those of you who are knitters. Uh, and then what are the norms? <clears throat> you know, what's what's considered normal within that kind of culture? You know, what's what's considered like a normal thing to make or to do or to, to a way to, to think about knitting, whatever it is. So every c culture, though, has these four components that make it a culture. This is part of what make it a culture in and of itself. So then we, we could talk about co-cultures as well. Now, this is the idea that all of us have multiple co- we have multiple cultures. We are not just one thing. We are multiple things, right? We are lots of different things, and we belong to lots of different cultures. So there, there are these larger kind of cultural aspects, like like being an American would be a broader one, right? It encompasses a lot of different things and a lot of people. Um, and But we have, you know, maybe our primary culture, but then within that, we have a lot of different cultures that make us who we are uh, within uh, our, our uh, this larger culture that make us who we are and it's going to be different for everybody but we have all these different co-cultures so you know we, as you think about again any kind of uh, the way you would describe yourself really would you describe yourself as an american would you describe yourself as you know what what, uh, what with what ethnicity what nationality uh, but uh, but also then um moreover because uh, those aren't exactly cultural things ethnicity and nationalities we're going to find out um but things like you know what are your interests where do you live geographically? I mean, that's going to define your culture in some ways. You're going to pick up things from your culture, like I said, pop or soda or Coke. That's a geographic kind of distinction. We could put out a map that shows you kind of where those lines are drawn, right? But within us, we have all these different cultures, and everybody has all these uh, variety of co-cultures within them. Now, we tend to think of culture as this kind of like huge thing where it's somebody from a different country. Right? Or somebody from a different part of the world has a different culture. And that's true. They, they probably do have a different culture in many ways, and, and you know, big ways or small ways. But it's not just there. We have different cultures across the United States, right? Every, every kind of part of the United States has its own culture. We could talk about cultures that are different, ways that were different in the Midwest where I live as opposed to the South or the, the Northeast or the West Coast or whatever. You know, again, just as simple as do you say pop or do you say soda? Or things like how accustomed to, are you to things like tractor pulls? How familiar are you with things like tractor pulls, right? Uh, so, and just different ways of doing things that, uh, that that are, you know, regional across the United States. But even then, even within that, even within the same household, pretty much any hobby that you have would represent a culture, would, would could be identified as a culture. So even within your house, you have multiple co-cultures for each person. Everybody's going to have different co-cultures because presumably you don't all have exactly the same 
interests and desires and, and ways of thinking about things. So you have lots of different co-cultures that exist even within your own house and within your own community. Right? So we have uh, all these co-cultures that are defined again by, um, uh, that are learned and shared uh, and a set of symbols, language, values, and norms. And we use this to distinguish one group of people from another. That's the last part of the definition, right? All of this is about distinguishing one group of people from another. And really what we're talking about here is just kind of in groups, what we call in groups and out groups. If you would say us, if you, if you're talking about something and you would say us or we as a part of that, as in you're a part of that group, then that's an in group for you. If a, you would say them or they, or whatever else, you know, that, that, that you're not part of that group, that would be considered an out group. And it's as simple as that. We use culture to say, I'm part of this group but I'm not part of this group. I am a uh, Gryffindor, but I am not Slytherin. I am, you know, I'm, I love Lord of the Rings or I don't love Lord of the Rings, right? The, those types of things are, you know, uh, the, or I'm pop versus soda. Pop is my in group. Soda is my out group. So just, we use it to define um, different groups and to distinguish one group of people from another. So again, that's what culture is. It's the, it's the, um, the learned and shared set of symbols, language, values, and norms used to describe or to define one group of people from another. Now, I want to talk for a second about what culture is not. Let's undefine culture for a second here. So because we know that culture is learned and shared, culture then by definition is not ethnicity, race, or nationality. These are not cultural aspects. Okay, these are not cultural aspects. Now, I say that and you say, well, you know, people of, of the same race certainly have, they share a culture, right? Now, technically, no, they don't. I mean, not, you don't have to share a culture with somebody just because you're of the same race. Your culture could be very, very different. Now, oftentimes people of a, a shared ethnicity, race, or nationality will share a culture by virtue of kind of being in the same place, right? We kind of congregate with people who are like us and who are similar to us, we feel like we have a kinship with those people. So, um, so we are likely to uh, congregate more and, and be around people who do share an ethnicity, race, or nationality with us. It's not uncommon. So oftentimes, uh, culture will follow ethnicity, race, and nationality pretty closely. Uh, but by definition, they, they do not constitute culture because as we've said, culture is learned and shared. Now, to kind of to kind of just show you what I mean by that or to discuss what I mean by that. I am from Indiana. This is where I live. And if you know anything about Indiana, you know, especially if you're from Indiana, you'll be able to appreciate that, you know, there's really two distinct halves to the state. It's not exactly half, but there's northern Indiana and there's southern Indiana. And there's kind of a line, right? And down the middle, there's a, there's a river, right, that runs through here, uh, literally a river that runs through it and it kind of divides Indiana. And if you look at a topographical map of Indiana, uh, you can see that river right there. And then you can see this is this is the topographical map. So it's showing the contours of the earth in Indiana. You can see that the northern half of Indiana is extremely flat very flat. And the bottom half of Indiana is more hilly. It, it, it's not mountainous by any stretch, but it's hilly. I mean, there's some pretty good size hills in the southern part of the state, especially if you're from the north and you're used to just straight up flat farmland, right? So it creates this kind of dis, you know, topographical distinct distinction. And there is a very distinct cultural difference even between northern Indiana and southern Indiana, right? Lots of cultural differences partly because of the way that it was settled. And we know that ethnographically speaking, um, when we look at the ethnographic history of the United States in part, we know that, uh, that it's, again, it's not uncommon for people to settle in a place that seems familiar to them. So we look at immigration patterns over the history of the United States, um, you know, of kind of the contemporary and modern post-revolutionary era of the United States or, or around that, that time, uh, talking about from the pilgrims on really. We know that, that, that this part of the country where you have the, uh, the Appalachia, right, and, and have these mountains was settled largely by um, people from like Scotland and, and places like that, where the geography was kind of very similar to those areas, right? Whereas the northern part of the country um, has um, was settled, you know, if you look at like Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, that was settled much more by Scandinavian and German uh, type of uh, immigrants and things, because again, it resembled their homeland. It's what they're familiar with, right? And so when we look at the topography of Indiana, if you go back and think about that again, 
the southern part of the Indiana is much more like Kentucky and Tennessee. So it was settled by people who are basically from that, that part of the country that share that history of like Appalachia and, you know, again, Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, whereas the northern part of the state was settled more by people who are from the same people who settled Michigan and Wisconsin and things. So they really are just very deep cultural differences between the northern and southern parts of Indiana, largely based on just the topography and the, and the way that the state geographically lays out. Okay? It's just kind of interesting, I guess. So here you have, though, culture following, uh, the, you know, sort of following race and ethnicity and nationality and things in that sense. You see the same thing when you when you look at uh, New York City, for example, and specifically Manhattan. If we were to look at lower Manhattan and we zoom in here a little bit, you're going to see neighborhoods listed here. And those neighborhoods, some of those neighborhoods have names like like Chinatown and Little Italy right, and Little India. So why would they have these names? Well, it's because when immigrants came here, they settled together. That, I mean, Culture is not defined by race or ethnicity or, or um, nationality, but it oftentimes does follow those things because when you move somewhere else, especially when you're coming from a large distance and you have significant cultural differences where you're moving to, you tend to congregate with those people who are most like you. And so you tend to find those people who oftentimes have a shared ethnicity or race or nationality because they share the same culture that you are familiar with oftentimes, right? So then you have these congregations of people and you end up with neighborhoods like Chinatown and Little Italy and Little India uh, because those people find each other. So culture will often follow ethnicity, race, and nationality, uh, but it is not by definition culture because culture, as we know, is learned and shared. The other thing real quick that we want to think about culture is we want to avoid ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism is the idea that your culture is inherently superior to another culture. When it comes to culture, the key term we need to, to have in mind is different, not better or worse, not good or bad or, or you know, good or evil. Um, that's not how we define culture. We define cultures as just different. But ethnocentrism is when people fall into this trap of my culture is just inherently superior to yours, right? So if we had this, uh, eth if we had a, an ethnocentric view uh, of uh, the world um, uh, for Americans, a lot of people think Americans are kind of ethnocentric and see the world like this, right? Where America is the center of the world and other places can just be categorized quickly. This is where coffee comes from. This is where zoo animals come from. They make our stuff over here. And America is the center of the world where everybody wants to be. And it, and it is obviously superior to everything else, right? That's an ethnocentric view of different cultures, uh, which is Again, not what we want. We want to appreciate the differences in culture, and it's okay to celebrate your culture. It's okay to take pride in the culture that co culture and co-cultures that you have, but we need to avoid this idea that our culture is inherently superior to others. And in fact, when we looked historically at the at a more traditional map here of the world, this is what's called the Mercator projection map, and it was developed a long time ago, and it's very Eurocentric. Right. It's developed by people in Europe, um, and, and we can see that now that we have a more um, accurate view of the world from satellite views and things like that, that this is just not an accurate representation of how the world actually looks. So Europe is, first of all, Europe's in the center of the world here, of course, but uh, but it's also larger than it actually is. Africa and South America are, are smaller than they're represented as smaller than they actually are. Um, so there's actually a map. Um, that is that is more uh, more accurately reflects the proper proportions of things here. When we look at it, it's called a Peters projection map. So um, we can look at the Peters projection map here and just see the difference, right? We can compare these things and say, oh wow, that is a big difference, right? We can see how much smaller Europe is in proportion to some other place, how big Africa is and South America is compared to that uh, than they were represented in the traditional maps. In fact, here's one laid over the other. The blue is the Peters projection map, which is the accurate kind of uh, proportions of things, and uh, the yellow is the Mercator. So you can see what a difference there is, and that again just stems from ethnocentrism, this view that at that time, while well, Europe is the center of the world, it's the best. And so we ought to make it bigger and ought to be, you know, have better representation in the map. So the map is just kind of skewed. And there are people who think that, uh, that it's, in fact, it's not fair that the map always portrays some parts of the world on the bottom and that that may psychologically at least have an impact on people who live in those parts of the world. And so they would uh, stipulate that it should not only be the Peter's projection map, but it should be turned upside down for a while. Uh, how does that strike you? Man, that really, you know, I've seen this, I don't know how many times now, but uh, it strikes me as so different every time I see it. But I mean, in some ways it makes sense. You know, why would, why does 
the, the North America and Europe and things always have to be at the top. Why can't Africa and, and South America be at the top and Australia be at the top of the map for a while? Would that have an impact on uh, on their view of themselves and their perspective? So anyway, we want to avoid this ethnocentric view where we see our culture is superior to others. We can see it as different. That's totally OK. That's totally fair. But we don't want to see it as superior to or better than another culture. OK. So again, culture is the learned and shared set of symbols, language, values, and, and norms used to distinguish one group of people from another. Hopefully this helps you appreciate uh, what we're going to be talking about and understand more clearly what culture is and what it is not. Okay? Because culture is a significant part of, of communication and, and understanding again, the ins and outs of what it is and what it isn't is going to shape our entire discussion here. If you have questions about about culture and about what it is and how we defined it and anything else we've talked about in this video, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. Uh, in the meantime, I hope that you do have a new appreciation for an understanding of culture and a more accurate definition for culture as we begin, again, our look at intercultural communication.